eMain Enterprises. I appreciate everybody joining. We're delighted to have with us today two members from Fluke. I'd like to introduce to you Tyler Evans, Business Unit Manager, Fluke's Vibration and Alignment Products, and John Burnett, Application and Product Specialist, Fluke's Vibration and Alignment Products. And today we're pleased to present John and Tyler to share with us a session on launching and sustaining a healthy reliability program. Uh, before we get into the program, just a couple of housekeeping notes. We are going to be taking audience polls throughout the session, and we're going to save questions from the audience at the end. We will make a recording of today's session available afterwards, and we'll be sharing that with registrants as well as posting it on our website. As a reminder, everybody, eMain is a CMMS software provider who offers a wide array of webinars and educational offerings. Our best practice webinar series, uh, which this is a, a session in that series, focuses on maintenance strategies with speakers from a variety of industries who offer complementary products and services to share their knowledge. This is not an eMain product demo or training session. And with that, I would like to turn things over to our uh, guest speakers, Tyler and John. Gentlemen, we're delighted to have you here. Won't you uh, do a little bit of intro for our audience? And we look forward to your presentation today. Yeah, thank you, Han Lori. Uh, this is Tyler Evans. I just want to say we're very excited to be um, uh, sharing this stage today uh, with eMain, and uh, we're extremely excited uh, that eMain is is part of the Fluke family uh, now. And so, with that, I'd like to go on um, to the next slide. Let's see here. Um, hmm. Do I have keyboard and mouse control? I was, yes, you do. I was you should be able to ad to advance forward. Let's see here. Oh, something. Yep, that worked. Uh, okay, so I'm sorry about that. I just want to introduce myself. My name is Tyler Evans. Uh, I'm the business unit manager for Fluke's vibration and alignment tools, and uh, I've sp I spend a lot of time in my career as an engineer uh, and in the factory setting. Um, I, my my journey to reliability really came through quality management. That's where I really started to learn about reliability, and then I've been continuing that same journey through reliability um, here at Fluke. Uh, trying to develop products that, that help enable reliability. Uh, John, why don't you give a, a little introduction about yourself? Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm John Burnett, and I'm an application specialist at Fluke for the vibration and alignment products. And uh, in my uh, 30 years, I've spent uh, my first uh, 12 years in the U.S. Navy as uh, on nuclear power plants, uh, operating maintaining nuclear power plants. And uh, that's where I learned quite a bit about uh, maintenance and reliability. And then I worked for a, uh, a vibration uh, company that uh, uh, set, sets up reliability programs with customers. And then I've been with Fluke for about five years now, uh, continuing to help customers set up reliability programs. All right. Thanks, Tyler. So today we really want to focus on uh, some really practical tips uh, that will help anyone on their reliability journey uh, towards maintenance best practices. And the, the reason we're doing this is because, one, achieving a culture of reliability is extremely difficult and uh, it's also rare. Uh, very, lots of people uh, go down this road and attempt this journey and uh, it's, it's very difficult. Um, second of all, related to number one, uh, anyone can start up a reliability program, but actually sustaining it and scaling it are the difficult parts. That's where a lot of people uh, struggle, and we're going to talk about the three most common reasons that we see as we visit customers all around the world. We're going to talk about what we're finding uh, they struggle with. And then three, we really want to talk about uh, 
how culture is what really can change uh, and, and sustain a reliability program. And so we want to talk about the relationship between culture and tools. Uh, throughout every single age of history, cultures have been defined by the tools that they adopt and the tools that they use. And so uh, I hope it's not too bold to, to really take that same perspective to, to reliability. Now, uh, the other things we're trying to do in this presentation is we, we really want to talk about how to organize your maintenance team and, uh, and we want to talk about technology. Um, and we also want to give everyone who's watching some tools and some frameworks that they can use to sort of self-assess and, and diagnose their own uh, where they are on, on the journey to reliability. And we also want to talk about this reliability journey from a real world standpoint. There's, we find that out in the world there's no shortage of people who are willing to wag their finger at you and say, well, the only way to have good reliability is to do all of this and have all these resources and to never let these things drop and to always have 100% uh, management uh, buy-in and all this kind of stuff. And, and we, wanna, we really want to talk about that there's some real-world practical things that anyone can do in any situation uh, to, to advance their reliability journey. So we want to focus on that real-world uh, practicality. Now we're going to talk about uh, three pillars to successful maintenance uh, and, and these are the three pillars that John and I see when we go all around the world and visit customers uh, to talk about either vibration products or to talk more broadly about reliability in general. We see that three things cause, consistently cause programs to fail. One is during the program startup, the organizing of, of your reliability program. And so we want to talk about uh, that. And then secondly is reliability programs can fail because of the way that they select technology. So we want to just be clear, this isn't because people choose one brand of tool over another brand of tool. It's really about the, the philosophy that people adopt and the, and the relationship that people have with their, with their technologies and how they choose them. And, and John's going to talk a lot more about that in detail. And then finally, uh, the one that is probably the most often overlooked or underestimated is data management. Reliability and proactive maintenance are all about condition data, monitoring machine condition. So data is just a, an integral part of a reliability journey. And a lot of people underestimate how to manage that data and how managing that data can trip them up. And so we really want to talk about that and highlight that. And, uh, and we want to talk about how connected tools enhance all three of these pillars. And so with that, we're going to get right into it. So, And Tyler, um, this is Hannah Lurie. What I thought might be helpful is to launch an initial poll question to the audience just to sort of gauge um, where, they, uh, where they are in their reliability journey today. Um, so we've just launched that poll, and we uh, invite folks to uh, quickly give us a, a flavor for where they are. Uh, options are all reactive, some proactive, have tried in the past but have abandoned, have tried in the past but are starting again, um, ha have tried in the past and have abandoned many times, uh, and have a well-developed. And I think this will just help us sort of gauge where folks are today. So we'll just allow uh, for a couple more seconds for the audience to complete. And yeah, I think we're, we're good there. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and show that, the results. And we're going to close now. So the results that we saw from that are 12% of the audience are all reactive, uh, have never uh, attempted to move beyond. 57% uh, have some proactive activities in place on some of their equipment. 4% uh, have tried in the past. 
Uh, 16% have abandoned it in the past. 16. Uh, 16%. And 12% have a well-developed proactive maintenance uh, program established. So um, interesting results and we'll of course be able to keep that in mind as as you share uh, as you continue to share today's session. Yeah thank you. Th this is actually Hannah Lori rescuing me a little bit because we were supposed to run this poll a couple of slides back but I wanted to point out that how rare it is to have a well-developed proactive maintenance program. So we're, we're seeing, if I'm understanding correct, 12 percent? Correct. And 57 yeah. percent have some uh, proactive maintenance in place on certain pieces of equipment. That's right. So, so most of us, and this is normal, uh, most people, uh, most companies uh, all over the world are at the very uh, early stages of adopting reliability practices. So I want to talk about uh, now on this slide what is what makes it so hard. So the, the number one thing to do to start a reliability program is to perform a criticality analysis. Now some a lot of people on this call may already know what this is and I, I don't want to I don't want to go into a big education on this. There's a lot of resources online to figure it out and to learn about it. But it's basically trying to evaluate all of your different uh, assets that you maintain and machines and ranking them or prioritizing them in terms of how important they are, their criticality. Um, and so the problem with this is uh, this has a, a, an effect almost every time a company goes on a criticality analysis they realize that there's a lot more things that are a lot more critical than they thought and so there's there's this big resource constraint thing where where people are saying look we've we've got limited resources but all of these critical assets how on earth are we going to maintain them so uh, people typically, uh, we see companies take a few different approaches. So first of all, they might take the binary approach where they just say, here's my list of a hundred assets and I can only, uh, I'm only able to maintain 20 of them and therefore I'm going to make a cutoff line. The, anything above this line of criticality is critical and anything below isn't. So if, and, and then they're just going to focus on those critical assets. The problem with this is, the biggest problem with this is that non-critical assets still break down and you end up having to react to non-critical assets and so you end up being dragged, even though you're trying to get proactive on these critical assets, your non-critical assets still gobble up your time and drag you back to a reactive uh, to a reactive operating mode. The next one is dynamic. So if you force rank everything and, and you know that everything on your list is less critical than the thing above it and more critical than the thing below it, then we just say, look, whatever we have time to do, we're going to do, but we're going to always do it in this prioritized way. So there's this if I have time for 20 assets this week, I'm going to do 20. If I have time for 100 assets this week, I'll do 100. The, this is a better way, but it still has the same problem of in any given week, there's assets that aren't being monitored. And so the, these assets can still break down and they can still uh, force you to back into to a reactive mode. And then here's the other thing. The other one is, look, we're just going to put every asset on a schedule. More important assets are going to get monitored more frequently, and less important assets are going to get monitored less frequently. And so there's this attitude that when resource constraints come up and when things get tight, all we do is push out the schedule further. You know, it's like it's like punting in football. Um, and so this, there's this sort of attitude, well, I can maintain every asset on Earth as long as I can schedule it out far enough. And there's a subtle point here because I don't want to imply that, ask, that uh, maintenance scheduling is not important. It's, of course, extremely important. It's the foundation of any good maintenance program. The problem comes when people mistake 
scheduled maintenance for sufficient maintenance. So this, you can see this is kind of a subtle trap where people believe they're maintaining and covering all their assets because everything's on a schedule. But if they're not covering their assets frequently enough, then this, those same assets are still breaking down even though they're getting checked from time to time because they're breaking down in between those checks. And so that can also drag a team right back down into the same old reactive maintenance. Um, and, uh, and then the final one is full coverage. People say, look, there's no way around this. The only way to avoid getting dragged back to reactive maintenance is to go full investment. I've got to have full staff, full budget. Otherwise, any other method is going to, we're going to fall back into reactive. Well, this is also uh, a very tough scenario uh, to, to do. Um, and it also, it sort of misses the point. It says, it sort of relays this attitude that good reliability is completely outside of my control. We'll only ever be able to achieve it if other conditions change, like the level of investment or the level of senior leadership commitment or things like that. And we would like to propose that that's not the case, that maintenance teams do have control to begin a maintenance journey, a reliability journey, and they can, uh, they can extend their coverage of their assets. Um, so all of these approaches are inflexible and unsustainable, and I'm trying my best to paint a picture of doom and gloom, and I think you can imagine that, that I'm going to propose an answer here to this. And, that and is, Tyler, um, if I may, before we advance um, to that, it, it may be helpful to gauge from the audience another poll to learn which of these um, following best describes our audience's current progress on their reliability journey. So I'm just going to launch a poll quickly, yeah. and it'll take, um, if, if folks who are listening wouldn't mind to share where they stand in those, uh, in each of those components. So and this we'll will leave the poll open here for just about 30 seconds, and then we'll share that. Yeah, Hanna Lori, before you close the poll, I just want to say, usually at any given facility, there's a mix of these things happening. So the purpose of the poll is we just want you to sort of generally pick which one, which one feels like the most common or the more the most operative scenario uh, okay. in your maintenance team. Uh, so in other words, just acknowledging it'll be an imperfect poll, but just a nice way for us to to sort of talk about where people are. And so we just closed the, the poll, and um, so here are the results of which strategies describe, uh, describe our audience's approach. And, uh, and as you can see, the, the one that's by far uh, gotten the most votes is I can maintain every asset as long as I schedule it out. Ah, okay. Followed by, if I have time for 20, I'll do the first 20. So some interesting uh, information to, uh, uh, to, to keep in mind as we continue our discussion. And what was the percentage on that? that 45% uh, say I can maintain every asset as long as I schedule it out. 45%, okay. uh, 21%, if I have time for 20, I'll do the first 20. 15%, if it isn't critical, don't bother me about it. And 10% uh, were equally among the last two, unless I have full staff budget, not worth keeping up, or we need to hire someone if we really want to monitor all of our assets. Yeah, so we hiring someone, outsourcing, often has the same problem as every asset on its own schedule, is that you uh, often uh, an outsourced reliability service provider, um, uh, it charges, you know, per, per measurement or per visit or something, and, and so you end up really having them only visit maybe twice a year or quarterly at best, um, some people invest enough money to have them come to have a service provider come on a monthly basis, but you're really struggling with this same thing of because the 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 condition monitoring measurements are so infrequent, 
you still end up with things breaking down in between. Uh, and so those, those breakdowns are precisely, those unplanned breakdowns are what drag a team away from proactive maintenance back down into the pit of, of reactive maintenance. And so, you know, maintenance teams aren't actually the only people that struggle with this problem. Uh, in, in a whole different industry, there's another problem, and, we, and we're going to talk about that. And, but as you think about your critical assets, in order to understand this, this methodology that I'm going to propose, I want to change some of our definitions about criticality. So here, we used to think, we're used to thinking of assets as either critical or non-critical. But instead, John and I want to propose maybe changing that, subdividing that into four buckets. Okay, so star yeah, okay. athletes. Tyler, are, I, I still see the poll up there. Yes, I am attempting to, um, to close it, and okay. I've uh, looked at the close. So give us just a moment to, uh, to close that. Bear with me one moment. So Tyler, the we still have the poll up there, but uh, you can go ahead and talk about it, but just know that the audience can't see, uh, all they see is the poll right now. Okay, great. Well, all I wanted to say was it's important to think of criticality. A really simple definition that John and I use is what is this asset's influence on the company's ability to, perf to make money? or perform its mission, all right? And so star athletes are these assets that, that uh, any percentage change in performance, any percentage improvement in performance will equal a percentage increase in revenue. Star athletes should be maintained in a very, very different way than any other asset. And so critical assets, really think of those as on and off. When the machine is running, we're making money. When it's not running, we're not making money. It's a simple binary relationship. Semi-critical is when the machine or the asset is down, we still operate, but it just strains the company. You know, one example is like, think if, if you're in a warehouse that has four forklifts. If one of those forklifts break down, the, the, uh, the, the factory doesn't stop, the, the warehouse doesn't stop operating, but each of those three remaining forklifts have to work 30% harder or longer or whatever. So when we have redundant assets, they're usually semi-critical, where if one goes down, then it puts strain on, on the others. And non-critical just means uh, downtime doesn't affect the company's ability to make money. Um, I want to move on to this this other industry. So in the healthcare world, they face the and excuse me, Tyler, just to address the issue of the poll. Not uh, we've had some technical difficulty on the display. So I'm going to take um, change the presenter back to me. Oh, okay, that's great. And I'm going to see if that won't um, won't make an adjustment for us. Okay. And then I'm going to pass control back. Um, And now I'll just pass control back to you, Tyler. And let's see if that doesn't clear it. Is everybody able to see my screen now? Yes, you can, we can see your screen now, Tyler. OK. So I just flashed this uh, slide that talks about the different, uh, a new way of thinking about criticality. And we can share this presentation with anybody if they want to review this in detail. But I, we really want to talk about this is, this is one of the big important points of this presentation. In the healthcare world, healthcare workers have the same criticality dilemma, but theirs is even worse because every single asset or patient is critical and they only have limited resources. So what do they do? One, they could create a cut line and say, well, People above a certain uh, importance, are we're going to take care of them, and people below a certain importance, we're not going to take care of them. Well, that's unacceptable. 
Uh, and Or they can say, look, or we're going to build up the vast resources needed to give every single patient 100% medical attention. And that's unsustainable. So uh, they've actually, uh, in the healthcare world, over decades, they have built up an operating model that solves this criticality dilemma or at least addresses it far more effectively. Everybody is, is familiar with this method. When we go to the doctor, we first see a nurse. The nurse takes some very quick vital signs, checks our temperature, our pulse, our blood pressure, uh, asks us some questions. If the nurse can solve our problem, then the nurse uh, gets us fixed and on our way and we go, and we go, to, uh, and we go about our work. If the nurse can't figure out what's wrong with us, then uh, he or she will refer us to a general practice doctor, and the general practice doctor will bring deeper expertise and more advanced tools to check what's going on and to figure it out. And if they can solve our problem, they fix us and they return us to work. And if a general practice doctor can't figure it out, they refer us to a specialist. And the specialist has the most advanced tools and the most specialized training and spends a, a deep amount of time investigating our problem and figuring out what's wrong and recommending the fix. This is so, such a common part of healthcare that even children when they play make-believe healthcare they, they, they enact this system. And what this system does is it has a tiered level of training and certification with tiered levels of workers and a tiered volume of inspections. The nurses are seeing far more people than the general practice doctors, and the general practice doctors are seeing more people than the specialists. And they're spending a tiered amount of time. Nurses are just doing very quick, easy, simple tests. Doctors spending more time, and specialists are diving deep. But all of this method is a method of managing by exception and doing condition-based monitoring on human beings based on exceptions to the condition. And so we want to see how this would play out in an industrial setting is you have people who are screening and performing simple entry-level screening uh, measurements and they're covering all of the assets in an entire facility and when they find assets that need help or are changing condition, then they, they move to a diagnosing and they spend time diagnosing only those machines. And then uh, when, if there's a problem that they can't easily diagnose, then they bring in additional resources, possibly an outside consultant or they, they, use the, they draw on the limited time of an in-house expert to spend time analyzing. So you can see this covers uh, these different asset classes would each take a, uh, experience a different kind of care. So semi-critical and critical assets really would run across this whole gamut. But non-critical assets, we wouldn't spend time diagnosing and analyzing non-critical assets. But further, the star athlete, the reason we use that funny name is, is to really draw on that healthcare analogy that you and I, we're like critical assets. We see a nurse and then we see a doctor, then we see a specialist. Bef uh, before we would ever get an x-ray, we would have to move through that entire uh, chain. But a star athlete, they get an x-ray once a month regardless of whether they're healthy or sick because the, the condition of that asset is so critical to the performance of the mission, right? And so this is a model that allows people to not spend time analyzing healthy machines uh, and, and to not reduce the num and it helps reduce the number of work orders that are spent diagnosing and analyzing and, and focuses on work orders that are just a basic route to, to run through all of your machines in a quick way. And you don't spend time uh, deploying your scarce experts on simple faults uh, or on healthy machines. And so this model is a more effective way of, of extending your resources and covering all of your assets and helping limit that, that constant inertia to drag you back down to uh, reactive maintenance. Um, and, and so I think we're going to have John now talk about uh, it, we, we typically 
uh, only have had tools for reliability that address the complex analysis. And so now I'm going to hand it over to John to talk about uh, how to change that. Thank you, Tyler. Um, so um, now that uh, Tyler has talked about uh, pillar number two, let's talk about um, the, the second pillar of a successful uh, proactive maintenance program is to, um, oop, hang on just a second, I need to turn my screen on, okay, now we're ready to go, um, is uh, to select uh, the technology. There's a lot of different technologies out there and we need to think about our, uh, our applications and our assets about which technologies we need to look at. So if you look at this curve, many of you may have already seen this, it's called the uh, uh, potential failure curve and when you look at it you'll see that uh, um, this curve over, and this is just a conceptual idea, there's no numbers or, or uh, uh, dates or uh, progress or anything, it's just talking about um, if you've got a machine that's been running along good and then when it first starts to get in that potential failure up on the upper left and as the machine starts to progressively fail over on the far right, there are some things that we could do along the way to check on this machine. And uh, many of you have probably heard of these technologies and the order really is important and the order quite often depends on which one uh, your application and your machines and uh, but if you look at this you'll see there's oil analysis and ultrasound and electrical and thermography um, but as, as these technologies are used to look at machines and to give us an idea of the condition of the machine because many of us just let a machine go until we hear the noise or it's hot to the touch but if we wait until audible noise or hot to the touch much, um, that, or maybe the machine fails before we have any indication. Another thing to think about is um, if we let a machine get to the point where it's audible noise, number one, the uh, damage is already done. So the bearings are already bad. The shaft is already, you know, uh, damaged. We already, we already have to, uh, so if we would have caught this up earlier when it was still in the somewhat good um, with using one of these technologies we could have reduced the cost of the repair and the other thing that's very big nowadays is energy. We're wasting energy. If a machine is even imbalanced or misaligned a little the bearings could still be fine but if you've got a little bit of imbalance or misalignment now you're having problems with your energy waste. So we need to think about some of these things. So which technology do we pick? Now, down at the bottom, we've got a different way of looking at this. If you think about keeping your plant up and running, we need to think about all of our assets from input to output of, of, of energy. If you think about it, over on the left is your, your input power, then you have your motor, your drives and drive outputs, then you have your motor windings and your lead windings. Then you have your motor insulation. Uh, then you have your rotating equipment, the uh, pumps and the fans for vibration. And then you have your uh, process uh, uh, tools. So think about it. Every link in the chain is critical. And so we can't just say, oh, we're only going to focus on the electrical or we're only going to focus on the mechanical because if anything would go from left to right, this machine could fail. And that is what we're trying to not have happen. We need to keep this machine going. So let's think about, when Tyler talked about a tiered approach for the medical industry and a, and a tiered approach as a way to keep our plants up and running, let's think about different technology, different tools thinking about using a tiered approach, a way to screen and diagnose uh, and then analyze. So let's use vibration as, a, as an example because for the past 30 or 40 years we've had two tools available to us. The high-end vibration analyzer 
which takes an experienced vibration analyst to know how to run and, and analyze a lot of uh, uh, graphs and, and data, or on the other end is a low-end vibration pen, and it just gives us a number. But that number doesn't give us a lot of information. So you can see that in the last few years, um, two new types of tools have popped up to fill the void between the low-end pen with little information and the high-end analyzer that takes advanced training and experience and a lot of time to analyze. And so you can see that these tools are designed uh, with a tiered approach in mind to look at how can we find answers and how can we determine which machines have problems without having to use uh, an expert on one end or not enough information at the other. So let's, let's talk about that. So here you can see we've laid it out in a, uh, in a way to kind of think about it from end to end. When we first have uh, trying to keep a plant up and running, when we think about a tiered approach or a, hey, let's use our resources uh, more efficiently, we're first going to think about screening our machines. And we, we screen our machines to find out which ones are good or bad. We don't have the time to diagnose or go out and analyze hundreds of machines. So let's knock that down to a, to a, a manageable number. So let's use uh, electrical, mechanical, and thermal tools to screen our tools and first find out which ones are good or which ones are bad. Next, we now, now that, so think of that first one as, as our nurse, the nurse uh, for our machines, to screen our machines and tell us of the 5,000 machines we have, which machines are good or bad. If it's good, let's not worry about it. But if it's bad, let's bump this up to the doctors. The doctor for our machines is the vibration tester. Again, I'm using vibration as an example. We can also do this on electrical and, and thermography type tools. But the second thing is, is without calling in an expert, let's call in a doctor who's going to find the most common problems with our machines. And, and instead of spending a lot of time analyzing data, if a machine is pretty easy, let's just look for the most common faults. And for rotating machinery, that's imbalance, misalignment, bearings, and looseness. Once we found the fault, we then need to call in a corrective tool, like a laser alignment tool, that would quickly and easily uh, precision align a machine. So that would be our specialist, you know. So our specialist would, uh, we then have to have some surgery or, or have uh, uh, something done to fix the problem. And then finally, we don't just stop there and say, okay, it's ready to go. Let's check the machine. Let's, let's use our screening tools that we used at the beginning to check our machines and make sure, yes, this machine is ready to get back into service. So to kind of wrap this all up, we start with screening tools at the bottom of our pyramid, just like we did in the medical industry. We screen our machines using simple tools, and then we do some, some correction if we find a problem. That could be greasing a bearing, replacing a bearing, it could be a, uh, electrical. If, uh, and then, then we would verify it and, and we would return that machine to service. But if there's a machine that is a little bit more complicated or, the, or we can't fix with our simple tools, then we would escalate that from the nurse up to the doctor with a more advanced tool. It isn't an expert's tool, but it's a little bit more advanced, and we would then diagnose it and, again, do some correction and verify it and return it to uh, service. And there's going to be a few machines that our doctor isn't going to be able to diagnose, and we have to bump up to the specialist using advanced analysis tools that's going to be able to find those final remaining problems that we would then correct. And then, again, we would verify using those tools before we would return that to service. And finally, if you think about all of these different technologies and all of your assets, 
we need to bring that all together because we've got a lot of different assets. We might be using different uh, technologies on different assets, and we've got different team members. We need to get everybody together on the same page. So using a tiered approach, we would have Jim and John and Frank and Betty and Sue, all of these people are working together with different technologies. And instead of having all of this information siloed in places we can't get to, let's share that information, let's collaborate that information, and let's work together as a team to keep the plant up and running. So if we had a better tool ecosystem, we could have better practices, better collaboration, and a better way to uh, improve our maintenance culture. Okay, so now I'm ready to uh, roll this over to Tyler. So Tyler, I'm passing this over to you. Okay. <clears throat> Is everybody able to see my screen? Yes. Okay, so I just wanted to point out that uh, John and I truly believe that uh, that if you have tools that are only designed for the expert, then I think you're creating a culture where there's only a silo of reliability uh, that's housed inside one expert. But when you use tools that enable an entire team to work in a tiered way, you really create a culture of reliability that goes beyond just one expert. Uh, and so if you're, really, if you're really embracing tiered maintenance, then you should be starting to get lots of asset machine condition data. And there's a lot of ways uh, that you can manage that data, and there's a lot of uh, differences in assets. Um, and I, this slide here is just intended to point out that that there's a whole spectrum of ways to manage this data and and there's also you would also want to manage data perhaps differently for very advanced assets versus for very simple or non-critical assets um, but I really want to focus on data management in a condition-based maintenance program is like finding problems in the data it's like a needle in the haystack um, the problem is that just having so much more data doesn't necessarily solve the problem. You have to have the right kind of data. For example, this poor farmer down in this picture has just implemented a, a huge reliability program and now has tons of data flowing to him, right? But is, but is all that data really helping him be more reliable? And, and the answer to that is really it depends. It can help him be more reliable. Um, and, and so we want to talk about data management as this third pillar that a lot of people overlook. And oftentimes, because they underestimate it or overlook it, they end up getting overwhelmed by this data, all this hay, instead of being helped and aided by it. Um, and so, you know, uh, to use another analogy, uh, jewelers have this acid test to determine whether something is true gold or not. And so we have kind of an acid test for determining whether or not your data management program is really helping you or whether it's doing something else. And so we say that you're looking for, is your data analysis program uh, enabling analysis? or is it limiting analysis, right? If, it, if all the analysis is happening on one person's laptop somewhere then, and only one person can do it, then you'll always be limited by however much bandwidth or availability that one person has. And is your data, it's one thing to just take measurement data, but are you capturing context? Or is there a way for people to take measurements and then also add notes about, you know, also there was a funny sound happening or there was a smell or this is the fourth time this has happened this month, or this always seems to happen whenever we get a fresh shipment in. Um, and then data integrity. You know, there's a lot of emphasis on traceability, but traceability is only as strong as its weakest link. And so one of the problems people face is feeling insecurity about uh, manually transcribed or hand-typed 
uh, notes and and uh, and is there a way to be sure that the data you're getting is true data that is not filtered through through somebody's through any other motives and data democratization has a lot to do with analysis but it's really a culture of reliability can't take hold unless more people are consuming this reliability data and seeing it and, and taking actions on it. And so if, again, if you're using tools that are locked up in one person's tool or that, where the data is locked up in one person's laptop, then, then you don't really have a democratized reliability program. And then data security, we love to talk about this because everybody else really likes to talk about security in terms of well, we don't want you know foreign hackers to hack in and and uh, steal all of our data. Therefore, uh, we insist on having everything uh, stored on premise and data never leaves our our uh, facility. But we find that usually data security and data loss happens from internal reasons. Somebody accidentally hits delete, or somebody doesn't maintain the the uh, the firmware. And off-premise, cloud-based solutions are usually, because of economies of scale, they're usually hundreds of times more secure, hundreds of times more difficult to hack, and hundreds of times safer. Um, and so we really try to change people's thinking about data security and what are the most likely disasters you're trying to, uh, to be secure from. And so here I've got, uh, oh, I should ignore that. Um, here I've got a uh, I've got a list of of just some of the most common ways that people uh, that people manage data, and we really find that people use a mix of these. And I've done of you know painting with very broad brush strokes here. I've I've listed out in sort of red, yellow, and green where some of these methods are strong and where some of these methods aren't as strong. And so you can see that by mixing and matching data management options, you can really get a great data management system. Now, we were going to do a little poll here to ask people what they, what they uh, use, but I'm feeling like in the interest of time, we should just move on. And so I'd like to invite everybody to just think about what data management practices do you use in your company to, uh, to help manage condition data, machine condition data. Um, and so Fluke has tried to, Fluke has tried to challenge itself to create a data management system that really enables tiered maintenance and really passes the ACID test and, and meets all of those things. So we have um, high level asset dashboard you can see this this round bar chart shows me the total number of assets in my plant that are in a green condition versus a yellow condition versus an orange condition versus a red condition so this is what i'd want to look at when i first arrive in the morning and just see what what do i what does this look like now down below you can see a sort of historical trend where uh, this, if you take this circle and bend it straight into a bar, this very final bar would be that today's circle up top. But this, this chart tells me a few things. One, it shows me that the total number of assets that I'm covering is increasing. So that's a good thing. And it's also showing me that the total number of assets that are in a, in a more serious condition is also decreasing. So this right here is really a picture of a team that's winning with reliability. But then I can drill down into, into this uh, chart and look on an, on an asset by asset basis what the history of condition looks like. So at the top, boiler number one is doing classic good condition, then it drops into a less good condition, and then we perform some sort of a repair, and so now it's back into green. Same with compressor two, but it looks like it's just happening over a longer time scale. And, uh, and motor 4 and pump 5 are similar, but really I want to focus on, uh, on connector 3. Connector 3 is showing this pattern of always going uh, failing and then being good, then failing and being good. So I would want to drill down on that and look at the notes and the context. When those measurements were taken and the, and the condition changed, what did the operators and the, and the maintenance team members write down? 
And then I can also drill down to that further and just look at the entire history, the entire measurement history for Connector 3. I can see trend lines of different technologies. I can see electrical trend lines, temperature trend lines. I can also see uh, uh, the thermal imaging history. And then I can even click on uh, single measurements within that graph, single points within that graph to look at the actual measurement itself and look at any notes that the technician made when they first did that. I can also compare thermal images uh, like comparing the current thermal image on the right with the original baseline thermal image on the left to see what's going on and where the problem is. Now I've given this a really high level overview of Fluke's Fluke Connect uh, data management system, but the beauty of this is is it really works from the bottom up, is as people go about their regular work, uh, following work orders and taking condition-based measurements, each of these measurements automatically gets slotted into a continuous trend and, and automatically assigned to an asset. So this asset record in column number three is building up automatically. And then the software is able to take all of these asset records and build the trend lines and summarize the trend lines automatically in, in uh, column two. And then it, the software takes every single asset and creates an overall dashboard picture automatically in column one. So all of this really happens naturally just by going through your regular work orders every day. Uh, and it builds up these high level views. And so the vision at Fluke is to take our, our connected handheld tools and connect all of that data up to a central cloud. And then we also want to build uh, fixed monitoring tools uh, and we've already begun building many fixed monitoring sensors that can live on an asset permanently and can send data up to that exact same cloud. So you've got your handheld tools, your route based tools and your continuous monitoring tools all in one single cloud. And then that same cloud it will soon be fully integrated into a world-class maintenance management and work execution system because when things go out of condition what we want to do is immediately and seamlessly issue work orders to take those corrective actions and we want to seamlessly order the parts that are needed for that particular uh, that particular repair and we want to be able to manage the asset and the asset history all in one central place that's available to all of the users of the maintenance team. And so in summary, when we do a good program startup and we choose the technologies based on the failure modes that we're actually trying to solve for and when we choose technologies that enable a tiered maintenance structure instead of choosing technologies that, that actually only make for a silo of reliability then we're able to start managing our data in a way that uh, enables more analysis, gets more people involved, gets all the stakeholders and all the team members uh, viewing the same set of data and participating in that. And that is what drives a sustainable reliability culture. So that's what we are trying to attempt here at Fluke. And, that's, and, and we believe that uh, these same principles can be implemented uh, at any facility anywhere. So now we want to uh, open it up to any uh, questions that anybody might have and and really uh, and just wrap it up. Thanks thanks so much uh, Tyler. I've uh, launched the, um, the, the question panel on the webinars available for folks to send in questions and I will relay uh, I will relay those uh, to you so that you can answer um, directly. And one um, to get started here that's come in is can you maybe d describe what level of training is needed to be able to work at, at each of those uh, three tiers that you started off with? Yeah, I would actually, I would pass that off to John. John, you want to speak to what kind of, tr what level of training is needed at each of those uh, different levels? Yeah, so if you if you think about it from a uh, the the, uh, the screening level, then a screening level is probably going to be um, uh, the training would be uh, an operator or a 
a low-level technician, um, and uh, most of the screening tools are going to take uh, a very short amount of time, maybe uh, maybe an hour, maybe even less, to learn how to use a simple screening tool like a, a vibration meter or a, a thermal imager or something like that. So by no means would, uh, would they have to be uh, anywhere uh, near uh, an expert or, uh, or even a, uh, a technician level. Uh, so this is entry level technician. The uh, middle tier um, using a, uh, a diagnosis uh, type tool um, would, pr would probably be, be a, uh, a mid-level technician. Somebody that understands and works on the machinery has a good understanding of the mainstream machines in their facility um, and um, with I would say uh, half a day's worth of training you would learn to uh, be able to operate uh, operate and use uh, the uh, the diagnostic tool like a vibration tester or a or a mid-range therm thermal imager when you look at the, uh, to kind of counter that, if you look at the high end, the uh, analyzers, the high end uh, equipment, um, we're, we're talking, um, um, you know, months and months of, of experience, probably more like years, you know, typically for vibration, for example. Uh, it takes uh, about a year to get good at being able to set up an anal and uh, start and measure machines. It takes another year to learn how to be good at uh, analyzing the data, and then uh, maybe another year to learn how to do some of the special uh, testing that would be required for some of these uh, really high-end machines. So, so if you ca if you look at the three levels. Uh, you're talking uh, years of experience and knowledge for the uh, expert analyst. You're talking um, hours uh, to learn how to go out and use a, uh, a diagnostic tool, and you're talking, you know, uh, an hour to. And so all of the the training can, uh, 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 you know, it, it can be done in a plant to be able to use this tiered maintenance approach. Tyler, did I did I leave out anything? I know I kind of rambled there at the end, but can you think of anything else? Yeah, are there, are there any other questions? There are. Um, a couple more have come in, and um, if any have uh, additional questions, we can certainly go a little bit past the top of the hour. The second question is, um, can you advise on what the best way to start uh, or restart a new or even a failed proactive maintenance program? Uh, any recommendations on, on steps to take to, to, to re, restart that? Uh, so I wanted to. I would like to share one thought, um, and and then John may have some additional thoughts. But I wanted to really share something that that John uh, has has taught me and has really uh, really emphasized and, and drilled into my head, and and that is uh, we often think that we need to start a program by starting with our most critical machines and then moving down the list or down our criticality list. But really, the problem that most reliability, uh, that most reliability programs face isn't a problem of not being able to maintain uh, complex machines. It's a problem about getting into a habit and building a culture. And so uh, we recommend that you actually start somewhere in the middle of your list. Start with some of your less critical machines to start building up the habit and start building up the processes and the rhythms and the cadence of reliability. And then as you get better at it, start taking on some of your more complex assets. So whatever you're doing today to maintain your complex and critical assets. Just keep doing that, and build your program from the middle. I, uh, the analogy I would make is, when I was trying to teach my daughter how to ride a bicycle, 
um, I had these two options. I could get her a bicycle with training wheels, or I could get her a balance bike. These new, these little low to the ground bicycles that don't have any training wheels or pedals. And uh, the the sales pitch for the balance bike was so interesting. They said, "Look, kids don't need any help learning how to turn pedals with their legs. Every kid knows how to do it. What they need help learning is balance." And so when you give a kid a bicycle with training wheels, they just learn how to pedal and steer, which is second nature. But then the, the training wheels actually keep them from learning how to balance. And so you end up with this ritual where you take off the training wheels and they're learning how to balance for the first time. And, so, and they have to just learn from scratch. Whereas the balance bike focuses on the thing that they need to learn, which is balancing. And it's the same with our reliability program. The reason the reliability program fails isn't because nobody knows how to maintain the critical asset. It's because it's all about the habits and the schedules and the rhythm and the data collection and the data management and the visualization. And those are the things. And so it's easier to start with less critical assets because then you don't get tripped up with the weird exceptions and, and, the, and those things. And so you start in the middle and work your way back upwards. John, did, did I anything you would want to add to that? You you covered everything just just great, uh, Tyler. The one thing I would add is, uh, and just another thing that just just to add on to that is, um, don't don't try to start too big, and don't try to start by changing your company culture because you know, the company's been doing it the same way for thirty or forty years. It's it, you can't start this unless you have unlimited resources. It'll never work. So what we always suggest and what I found to work, like Tyler said, is start small, start simple, and, 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 and maybe even under the radar, you know, because you're not going to be able to, the, uh, if you try to start at the top and say set up all 5,000 machines in your plant, by the time you even get a fraction of them set up, then upper management is wanting to, to have some type of a report and they want to know how many saves you've had. And you haven't even started the program yet. So the way to do it is start small, 20 or 25 simple machines, go out, get some good saves with those simple machines, and then wave the flag like crazy. Tell everybody that you saved uh, so much money on these, these few handful machines, and then get approval, get budget, and grow the program. If you do it a little bit at a time with simple machines and then move on to more complex machines, you've got a much better chance for success than if you try to start off with all the machines at once. And John, Tyler, um, in the interest of time, I, I, we can take one more question. There are a couple of questions that have come in right at the top of the hour, and I've committed to responding to those folks directly. One great question from somebody uh, in the audience is, um, where, uh, how are, is this fully integrated information and data management and work order management taking place? And um, I'm pleased to share with that individual that uh, Emate and Fluke are working together today to um, integrate our two solutions. We did a great proof of concept on the model with, uh, with Emate and Fluke customers right at the end of uh, uh, last month. And we will be um, sharing more details as, this, uh, as these two uh, technologies come together right at the start of 2017, but perhaps you guys would like to um, add to that in terms of the Fluke condition monitoring system and any other final thoughts you'd like to share on that. Yeah, I'll just say that Fluke uh, has a very active uh, product roadmap and our, our goal is to get uh, all of our most uh, important tools connected to the cloud and uh, we've got about we've got over 40 tools connected currently, um, and so you can go to flukeconnect.com uh, to learn more about those tools. And we've also begun uh, launching some of these uh, uh, sensors that can be uh, connected to equipment and can stay at the equipment. Uh, these what we call uh, fixed sensors. 
Um, and those, and we, our plan is to continue expanding the number of sensors that are, and the types of sensors that are available. Great. Um, good information to share. Uh, I want to thank all of our audience for attending today's best practice webinar session. The couple of questions that we weren't able to answer, we will answer you directly. Uh, shortly after today's session. And as a reminder to everybody, we will uh, be sending out a recording of this session. Anybody that would like copies of the slides will send those as well, but of course those will be present in the recording. I want to thank you, Tyler and John, for uh, today's session and, and thank everybody for attending. Uh, for um, those of you that are planning to attend the IMC session next week in Benita Springs, Florida, uh, both Fluke and Emate will be there. and We look forward to seeing everybody there in person. Thanks again, and, uh, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone.